Thanks again for being here this evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Henningsen. I'll be the moderator for all the candidate forums this evening. Um, candidates, uh, as you're coming up during your session, if I, if I still haven't seen you or checked you off your list, if you could do that on your way up to make sure I know everyone's here. Uh, housekeeping first, please make sure your cell phones are off out of respect to everyone that's here so we can make sure uh, questions and answers aren't interrupted. Uh, restrooms are located right outside the door in the hallway uh, if you need to go out there. Um, you know, I'd ask as we get started, you know, when we do these forums, uh, you know, we, we expect everyone to be professional and respectful of the candidates and the questions being, being asked. Uh, they're, you know, donating their time away from families this evening to come and talk about their platforms and, and the issues that are important to them as candidates. And as you submit questions, the only questions that will be asked are those that are submitted to our questions table. So we're going to have uh, Kathy and Polly walking around for the rest of the evening that will pick up your questions. So if you need pencil or paper, uh, you can raise your hand and John or Sherry will get it to you. And as you write your question, you can pass it to the outside of your aisle and Kathy or Polly will come out and get it and bring it to our questions table. Those are the only questions that will be asked and answered this evening, so they need to be submitted in writing. And please remember, the questions that will be asked to the candidates are regarding the issues. Uh, we will not ask or entertain any personal related questions to the candidates this evening. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, Ottawa Area Chamber of Commerce, the Legislative Action Committee, Franklin County Farm Bureau Association, and American Legion Post 60, uh, I believe. They're the ones that sponsor the cookies tonight as well, so thank you for that. And AT&T is one of our uh, regular sponsors for these forums as well. Thank you to Franklin County for providing the room and the county commission chambers. And uh, thank you to Franklin County for filming and making sure that this is put on the government access channel later as well. Uh, each candidate, when you get started, is going to have one and a half minutes with an opening statement before we answer and submit any questions. Uh, any opposed, unopposed candidate that's present uh, will get an opportunity to stand and, and make a one and a half minute uh, opening statement as well, but uh, will not have any questions to answer. So that said, our first panel is the Commissioner of Insurance, and we have Vicki Schmidt and Clark Schultz. Um, Vicki, I will begin with you if you want to start your one and a half minute opening statement. Okay. And I assume there's a timekeeper. Okay. Um, our time. okay. Okay. Great. Well, hello. I'd like to thank all of you for coming here, and I'd certainly like to thank the sponsors uh, for holding this event tonight. My name is Vicki Schmidt, and I am a pharmacist by trade. Uh, I still practice pharmacy when the legislature is not in session. I um, grew up in Wichita, Kansas. I married my high school sweetheart uh, when I was 18, so we're coming up on about 44 years of marriage. Uh, went to, uh, we lived in Topeka, we've lived in Topeka since 1984. I've served my friends and neighbors in the Kansas Senate the past 14 years. I served on the insurance committee for 12 of those years, and I currently chair the public health and welfare committee. I became a pharmacist because I wanted to help people, and that's the same reason I'm running for insurance commissioner. I'd like to be your advocate. I think that everyone uh, deserves an advocate, the citizens of Kansas, certainly the agents in Kansas and, uh, the, um, and the companies themselves. As a pharmacist, I get to see firsthand the struggles that people face, especially with their health insurance, and I see that what the rising cost of that insurance is doing to them. And I would like to be part of the solution in uh, looking at ways to remedy that. I think that life, I know that life has challenges, but I don't think your insurance ought to be one of them. And uh, I would really appreciate your vote on August 7th or before the polls are probably open. Thank you. Thank you. Clark, go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Clark Schultz. I'm running for insurance commissioner in Kansas. I'm currently your assistant insurance commissioner. Been at the department for about three and a half years. The Department of Insurance has been around since 1871, and we are there to make sure that insurance companies don't mistreat Kansans. That's what we're there for. Every aspect of insurance that you can think of. And uh, we last year had 21,000 Kansans contact us with insurance problems. Everything from a 
hail damaged roof that wasn't being replaced at a uh, the price that somebody was um, able to um, fix it for or a wrecked car or or health insurance one of my biggest satisfactions is helping people who have been diagnosed with some sort of life-threatening illness a physician has prescribed a treatment and perhaps the company the insurance company is calling it experimental and they're not wanting to pay for that that's when we get involved and uh, help Kansans that's what I want to do would appreciate your support on August 7th and uh, look forward to answering questions thank you okay well thank you both um, we'll do uh, one minute on this, this first question if you could Maybe just explain what you think the biggest issue facing the uh, Kansas Insur Insurance Commissioner is right now. Oh, um, <coughs> yeah, why don't you just alternate this? The biggest issue is probably always the same issue. It's making sure that consumers are not taken advantage of by um, insurance companies. We do that in a lot of ways. We do financial surveillance so that we make sure that companies are following the law. I was an auditor for 10 years for an insurance underwriter, and we do that to make sure that companies are doing what they're supposed to do. And so that's always, I suppose, the main focus is making sure that companies are doing what they need to do. Same okay. question. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, thank you for the question. Well, I think the insurance department has many responsibilities, certainly, but I think the high cost of insurance is something that uh, it's long overdue that Kansas have a discussion about the high cost of, health, of, of all kinds of insurance, but especially health insurance. And I think that it is time to get the people that can, uh, that are familiar with the issues around the table and to have that discussion and to talk about, it. is it rules and regulations that are creating that? Is it statute? Is, 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 our, is it our laws? Um, just what is it? Because we don't have very much competition in our state in some areas of insurance. And I think it's high time we uh, take a hard, hard look at that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and Mick, I'll let you start on this, this sure. question. We'll do one minute uh, on this question again. Uh, what is your experience in the insurance industry which makes you the best choice for the insurance commissioner? Sure, thank you for that question. You know, I get a deal with health insurance and um, every day in my life as a pharmacist, I deal with Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurances each and every day. I uh, get to talk to those folks on the phone and, and I get to try to help people. Um, I think that that's one of the qualifications that I have. And I have been a member of the Board of Pharmacy back in the 90s through the early 2000s, served as president of that board. That's also a regulatory body. And uh, the insurance commissioner's office is a regulatory agency. And I think I uh, have the qualifications as a pharmacist and as my experience as a state senator. Thank you. State law says that the insurance commissioner shall be someone that's well versed and experienced in the insurance industry. I believe that's a good law. I was licensed in 1999. I've managed two insurance companies. I was an auditor, as I said, for 10 years, auditing for an insurance underwriter. I served in the legislature. I was 10 years. I was chairman of the House Insurance Committee. I served in the Senate as well. And I um, also teach insurance at Washburn University. We need to have someone at the helm that understands the insurance businesses and is able to work with companies and to understand the issues. And I believe that I have those uh, qualifications. Thank you. Okay, I think this is our last question, uh, unless we get another submission. Um, yeah, we'll do uh, one minute on this question as well. Uh, elder abuse has been a hot topic in the insurance and securities businesses. Um, can each of you address maybe what your, your plans would be for uh, introducing new policies or enhancing policies that are on the books to help with uh, protecting elders with those types of products? We have a market conduct division that is constantly looking for issues like this. Anytime we find things, we take action. Now, as far as legislation, the Department of Insurance is a regulatory 
uh, agency. We don't pass laws. The legislature passes law and Congress passes law. We follow them. But anytime we find instances, whether it's financial abuse, whether it's physical abuse, we take action. And of course, we have a lot of educational programs that we are involved in in making sure that citizens know what to look for, what they know what to look for, for elder abuse and other abuse as well. Thank you for that question. <coughs> Thank you for that question also. Um, I don't think this mic is working. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, Clark. I'm invading you over here. We used to sit by each other in the, in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I feel very very fortunate to sit this like here. Okay, but I am Vicki. Um, anyway, thank you for the question and thank you for letting me use your microphone. Um, I have been really privileged to uh, be appointed by uh, Attorney General J Derek Schmidt on an elder abuse uh, ta task force and we have been meeting for several years now and several things have come out of that uh, out of that working group one of them was uh, regarding financial institutions and their fiduciary responsibility regarding elder abuse and and uh, we actually proposed legislation and uh, worked its way through and, and it and it is there i think those things are very very important as the uh, daughter of a um, mother with alzheimer's that uh, i know could very easily be taken advantage of uh, i have a real passion uh, for that issue and uh, I absolutely think that the insurance commissioner's office has to work with the attorney general and others to make sure that we care for our citizens especially our most vulnerable thank you okay well I want to thank the two of you for being here and, and going to answer questions uh, that's gonna wrap it up for the insurance commissioner so I'm gonna give us about a minute or two to, to kind of trade out seats and uh, next group that I'd ask to come up are the Governor and Lieutenant Governor. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Am I tired? Can I, can I just go on? Um, yep. Tom, if you're ready, go ahead, Ken. So, my name is Ken Seltzer. I'm a CPA. I'm a businessman. I had a career in business until I ran for statewide public office. My very first one, four years ago, won the Kansas Insurance Commissioner race, just what you saw here right before me. Won that in a crowded primary, just like we have in the gubernatorial race now. It was a crowded primary, and we won in the primary, and then won huge in the general election. So um, uh, there's more than a few parallels here. A little bit on my history, if I could. Um, I grew up in central Kansas on a farm in rural central Kansas, went to K-State. I like to tell my wife I got a good education. She's a KU grad. Uh, <laughs> went to K-State, got a degree in accounting, and then came to the Kansas City area to be a CPA. I was with one of the big eight at the time, one of the big eight CPA firms. So my background is financial. After six years as a CPA, I uh, went back to school, got an MBA, and then served in the insurance business for the rest of the my career until I ran for public office, hence the qualifications to be your insurance commissioner. We've done such a good job as insurance commissioner in driving down costs, reducing the number of state employees, and improving service to Kansas consumers that we were asked to run for governor. That's why I'm running for governor. It's as simple and straightforward as that. We will do the same thing. We will do exactly the same thing in the governor's office as we did in the insurance commissioner's office. I don't believe we have any submitted questions for you, Ken, so.
Okay, I might, I might ask something while we're waiting. Um, you know, maybe, maybe think about you know how how you would be different than um, the current uh, governor administration that's in, in office, and what types of things you you look to do if you were elected. That's very straightforward. Thank you. Thank you for the question. We're different because I have a business background. I am a CPA. We have in the office right now a physician who still practices as a plastic surgeon on a part-time basis. We need a full-time governor. Just like the Secretary of State who spends part of his time consulting with other states and spending uh, time on issues elsewhere, we need a full-time governor. That's one of the key differences. We're going to be 100% focused on Kansas issues all the time, including with my lieutenant governor. I have a lieutenant governor from Goodland, Kansas, who is extremely focused on, on rural issues, rural economic development issues, small community issues. It's a, it's a good combination, but we're going to bring our business background to do good things for Kansas, just like we did in the insurance department where we reduce cost and improve productivity. We'll do the same thing because we know how that works as a businessman. We'll bring that to the broader government. Okay, thank you for being here. We appreciate your, your time. Uh, we did have a candidate, RSVP, and not show up, so um, we're going to, we appreciate you, you coming up and making some comments. Typically, we don't uh, ask questions if there's an unopposed candidate up here, so uh, we do appreciate your time, and I think we're going we're gonna to change out and, and have our next group come up. So. Could, could I say, just remember that I'm the only one that thought enough of you to show up here tonight. <laughs> in the parade and Tom and Oxy, or I could have been in Emporia where the lieutenant governors are having a debate, but I wanted to be here, so I'm here. Remember, KS for KS, Ken Seltzer for Kansas. My mom got it right on the second kid. I'll tell you later what my older brother's name was. It didn't work. Thank you. KS for KS. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, each candidate will have a minute and a half for an opening statement. Uh, we have Mr. Taylor and Mr. Esau. 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 I practiced that earlier too, and I still messed up. So, uh, Mr. Taylor, I'll let you begin. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and thanks to all of you for being here as well. You know, an uh, election campaign is really just an extended job interview, and so as a candidate for this job, and you as the hiring authority, being the primary voters. I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, myself, and in doing that, I would tell you that uh, most of the day today I've spent time giving interviews. Um, and the number one question that I've been getting, and I hope I don't steal anybody's thunder here in a minute if you've asked this question already, but the number one question I've been asked today in a number of interviews is that what distinguishes you from the other people running for Secretary of State? And I would tell you there's basically five things. First. I have an almost 40 year uh, experience in management, both in the private sector and the public sector. Uh, that, that 40 years is unmatched by anybody else running for this job. And the Secretary of State is essentially a management position. About 50 staff and about $5 million budget. Secondly, I'm uh, the only candidate who's run a private sector business with $25 million um, revenues and 125 staff. Uh, I'm also the only candidate who has been a county commissioner and county auditor working with election officials for 13 years. Fourth, I'm the only candidate for the, in this race who has actually run a state agency in the past. And fifth, I'm the only candidate who's worked with the U.S. State Department working on behalf of our country in 15 capitals around the world on election management and security issues. Thank you. I'm Keith Esau. I, uh, there we go. Keith Esau, I grew up in central Kansas uh, in a little town called Bueller. Went to Tabor College, graduated with a music degree, and promptly went to, into the computer business. I taught myself how to program computers when the Macintosh computer came out, started my own company, and been programming for the last 35 years. And why do I say this? Because the Secretary of State's office is no longer the paper-pushing office that we used to think about. 
it, it's a technology platform. It keeps millions of records, whether it be voter records, business records, uh, lien holding records. It, it is a technology platform. And we see, we hear news reports all the time about uh, hackers trying to get into our, our various uh, agencies and, and, and all, uh, break into the databases all around the world. And I want to bring my technology experience to that office to make sure that we keep the, inter the data easy to access from Kansas citizens and that we protect it from the internet threats. I'm also a, a legislator for the last six years. I, I'm uh, currently the chair of the elections committee and I've made sure that we had uh, election audits that, that will be implemented starting this year. And that we now, any new machines purchased have to produce a paper ballot trail. Keith, I'll let you start with this first question and we'll go a minute minute uh, each on this, this question. What do you think will change the most in the Secretary of State's office if you are elected? Uh, I will improve the, the computer systems in the office that uh, make sure that, that we not only keep them secure, but that we make uh, records easier to use. I, I will work with the county clerks to make sure that all their uh, needs are uh, met and addressed regarding uh, election security and, and transferring of data. Um, I will improve the, the cross-check system that we are currently using to make sure that it stays secure and that we uh, get better results from the, the data as we are cross-checking that with other states so that we all benefit from the, from the use of that program. Yes, I, I think the most significant difference, most visible difference you would see under my leadership of the Secretary of State's office would be in communication. I've talked to over half the county clerks and election officials in Kansas in the last several months, and I have yet to meet one who feels like they, their communication with the Secretary of State's office is, is good, is satisfactory, is working. Talked to a couple today, for example, who told me that even though advanced voting in most counties in Kansas began on July the 18th, the Secretary of State's office only allowed, only let them know of a change that needed to be made in forms that, uh, on July the 20th. And so they scrambled real quick and spent $1,000, at least in one county, in the last few days to get those forms up and running as of this morning, as a matter of fact, six days after advanced voting began. I think the problem is one of communication, one of management, one of organization, and that's the primary thing that I would bring to the office. Thank you both. Um, Dennis, I'll start with you on this question. We'll go one minute on, on this as well. Um, I'm trying to think of how to answer this without it being a closed in question. <laughs> uh, do you believe illegal immigrant voting is a serious problem in Kansas? Uh, and if so, what would you do to fix it? I, my own personal judgment is that it's not. I've talked, as I said, that to a lot of county clerks. Most of them tell me they know the people who come in, they don't believe it's a serious issue. But I recognize there's a lot of people who do think it is a serious issue. So one of the things that I'm talking about here is auditing elections. And what I mean by that is auditing, auditing voter eligibility. We've had a proof of citizenship law that was in effect until the courts ruled, ruled it unconstitutional about a month ago. But even if it were still in effect, and it may be back on appeal, but even if it were still in effect, it's really a meaningless and ineffective law. Why? Because, number one, it only applies prospectively to people who are new to voting, 18 years old, moved in from out of state. Somebody like me who's been, been uh, registered to vote for over 40 years, if I was a non-citizen, this law would never have caught me. Secondly, the law requires the proof of citizenship through a birth certificate or other document like a passport. Those are easily forged documents. Guess what? The Secretary of State's office never ever checks, and has not for the last several years, ever checked to see whether any of those are, um, are valid or not. So I think that's our biggest challenge with, uh, with elections, and trying to prove that to people is the key. Can you restate the question? Sure. Um, yeah, do you believe illegal immigrant voting is a serious problem? Uh, 
the, the question there is, is what do you mean by serious? I, I don't think it's a rampant problem. We, uh, we don't have a lot of illegal uh, citizens voting, but it is a serious problem in that we, we don't want any. It, it needs to be a, a zero tolerance on, on having illegals vote in our elections. Uh, we need to do more checking on the the citizenship of people, and, and I think a lot more can be done in the office to do that, uh, um, to, to make sure that people are citizens. Um, we need to continue prosecuting any voter fraud that we find in order to deter people. I, I think the fact that we're actually prosecuting now instead of letting those go um, means that, that we will have fewer and fewer cases of it. and. Ideally, we'll end up with zero cases at some point, but there will always be the threat. Okay, that's all the questions we have submitted for uh, the Secretary of State candidates. Uh, thank you both for, for being here. Thank you for your time and, and, and uh, making the commitment. We will ask that the uh, U.S. House representative candidates come up next. And Did we do a, a summation? I thought there was a couple minutes to close. We do not have time allocated for that, just the opening the opening comments. Thank you. Thank you. We now have the U.S. House of Representative uh, candidates with us, and I'm just going to start at the end with Mr. Watkins. Uh, everyone's going to give one and a half minutes for an opening statement. Thank you so much. Thanks for having uh, this event. My name is Steve Watkins, and I'm the political outsider in the race. And what that means is I've never held office before. In fact, I've never even run for office before. See, I'm an engineer, I'm a builder, I'm a businessman. I grew my outfit from three people to 470 people operating in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm the first person to attempt both the Iditarod and Mount Everest in the same year. I was in the military, I served in uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and then uh, was in Iraq as a contractor. I was an arm, a paratrooper and an army ranger, as well as a scholar. My degrees are from West Point, uh, MIT, and Harvard. I believe in small government, low taxes, minimal regulation, peace through military strength, the free market economy. I believe in the gift of life and the Second Amendment. So if you're completely satisfied with uh, the state legislature, you're in luck. You've got a lot of candidates to choose from. But if you think we can do better, and that we must do better, then you're not alone. See, we knock on about a thousand doors a day, and resounding messages that people want the swamp drained by an outsider. That hasn't gone unnoticed, and we've received some flack. That's just because we're doing well. I don't believe the fake news. I'm here to serve, I've been serving my whole life. Thanks so much. Good evening. It's good to see you guys here. I, we always get a good crowd in Ottawa. It feels like a legislative copy almost, except we're missing Representative Finch up here. Um, I'm Karen Tyson, candidate for Second District Congress and your state senator. So most of me, most of you know me. You know I work hard. I work diligently. My husband and I are fifth generation Kansans. We own and operate Tyson Ranch in Lynn County. My husband was born here in Memorial Hospital. We have ties to the community. We do a lot of shopping here, so we notice your sales tax. We uh, appreciate you guys very much. And I'm a software engineer by trade. I've, I have a bachelor's in mathematics from K-State, bachelor's in computer science from K-State, and for you KU fans, my master's in engineering management from KU. I've had the opportunity to work up from small mom and pop startups to international corporations. And one of the projects I worked on most notably was space shuttle support at NASA. Yes, I was a software engineer for NASA. It was a great job and I did work, win awards there. And I continued that success in my career and I continued that success and experience in my legislative career. I've been in the House one term and I was elected two terms to the Kansas Senate. I am currently the tax chairman of the Kansas Senate and I work hard for my constituency. I'm very diligent 
about the time that I spend with my constituents. Thank you. Hey, everybody. My name is Kevin Jones. I'm also running for second district, and I am from Wellsville, Kansas, not too far from here. Yet, yeah, I'm kind of reminiscing because um, when I first kind of started in politics, I guess you could say, my first elected office was the school board over at USD 289. But my uh, first experience here, I was invited by a, a sitting commissioner to be on the planning commission, and it was right here. And so um, I, I was a planning commissioner and went off about four months ago. And so uh, um, when it comes to this room and a lot of the people here, a lot of you guys are familiar. And um, I want to just tell you why, personally, I'm running um, for the 2nd District. And, and that truly is, I see a lack of true servant leaders in D.C. And as I've talked to people from the very bottom of the district to the very top of the district, um, they say the same exact thing. There's people that are doing it more as a career versus doing it as the way I see it, a deployment. Most of you guys know my bio or you have it on your seat because my son Silas, who's in the back, um, he, he, uh, he handed those uh, flyers out, but um, I'm former military. Um, is there any former military in here? Thank you. Thank you very much for your service. I've traveled the district, and I've talked to our law enforcement. I've talked to former military, and I've talked to those folks. And one of the main things that we're dealing with, it, with our, is just mental health, opioid, different things, falling back on our law enforcement. It's probably one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with right now in the second district. I look forward to talking about that in a little bit. Uh, thank you. My name is Steve Fitzgerald. I'm not from here. I've never been in this room before. I had a hard time finding it. <laughs> Once I got in the building. Thank you very much. Um, I do know a few of you, uh, and let me introduce myself to the rest of you. I'm a retired military officer. Um, businessman and uh, have been in the Kansas Senate for six years. I'm running for the United States House in order to rapidly implement the President's agenda that he brought to us and we approved, which is to improve American security and recharge American prosperity. It's extremely important that we do that. And my job with your representative would be to help get that done in Washington. Uh, I joined the Army as a private I graduated as a lieutenant colonel. I served in the infantry in the Green Beret. I spent my time three years in uh, the Pentagon, three years in the Combined Arms Center uh, up in Leavenworth. And like many of us here, uh, I have served on the uh, school board, served in the Kansas Senate, and I have been very careful, as I think most of us have been, to make sure that we do our civic duty. I think we do this out of duty. And I want to thank you for coming out and doing your civic duty to inform yourself and for voting. Do not trust the candidate who never voted before he ran for this office. Thank you. Test, test. Is this thing on? My name is Vernon Fields. I am a retired United States Department of Justice employee, or also known as a retired federal law enforcement officer. I am a candidate that had to deal with officers and uh, agencies in a 12-state region, which covered from Los Angeles or California out to Guam. So go from California, take 10 states in. I had to interact with local, federal, and um, state officers, including elected officials. I am a council member, uh, so I do have a voting record. You have to kind of look for it, though. You know what I mean? Have you ever been there? I, am a, I have a doctorate in criminal justice. I am a PhD criminologist. Uh, recently, uh, Kevin Eichner had called me and asked me to come with him as we did a presentation at Lawrence Memorial Hospital to executive officers there. That is because I'm also a registered nurse with a master's degree in nursing. I am an educator. You heard me talk about Ottawa University. We just recently uh, had a conversation with the National League of Nursing where I was interviewed to see if we could move the program from a bachelor's prepared program to a master's prepared program. I'm still waiting to hear if we were able to move forward. So that ties me in here with this community some. Also my prior campaign manager, I have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> is the is the is the the, the, the pastor 
at Bethany um, Church here in town. Mr. Fitzgerald, I'm going to let you start this first question. You touched on this in your opening comments, um, and, the, and and we'll allow every candidate to answer the same question, and we'll go a minute and a half on this on this question. What do you feel is the biggest threat to national security? The biggest threat to national security today is the debt, uh, and I, I can back that up. We, <coughs> excuse me. We defeated the Soviet Union. <coughs> with our checkbook. Uh, the Soviet Union had arguably the best army, the strongest army. They certainly had a very large tactical air force. They had an extremely large navy in terms of submarines. Uh, I know this because I worked on war plans, and I was responsible for some of that when I was in Europe and when I was in Washington, D.C. What they didn't have was the ability to maintain their economy and keep up with us as we improved the technology that we put out in our defense. And they went broke. It was their debt that brought them down. Greece is going under because of its debt. We see it in many of the various states. The debt is the most important problem that we have and has to be solved. I spoke about American security and American prosperity. They have to go together. We need American security in order to protect our prosperity, protect our interests so that we can in fact be prosperous in a hostile world. We need our prosperity so we can afford that uh, security that we need for all Americans. So it's the debt. That's the biggest problem that we face for our security. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Fields, I'll let you uh, address that same question. As I indicated on law, law enforcement, so therefore it is going to be security first. I remember looking at the border as part of my job in the Department of Justice when my assignment included uh, California, Arizona, and New Mexico. Uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it, is a, it is a shocking uh, piece. What I mean by that is I remember in San Diego seeing that we had houses on this side of the border and houses on that side of the border and we had people that were able to go on the tunnels and, and avoid the fence. So we do need to look at firming up our security worldwide. Now, again, I, I try not to share a whole lot of this, but my job was also to take care of Tim McVeigh when I was in Colorado. When I got here in Kansas, my job was to make sure that his execution took place. So we, I am hard on, on crime. If you're gonna commit crime, then I'm gonna to continue to fulfill the will of the people by doing as the people had requested. So I'm still seeing that security. Did that sh shock us a little bit by having a, a, the first federal execution since 1961? The answer was yes. But have we seen any other acts like that in our country since we have it? So I'm thinking again that our biggest issue is safety and security and making sure that we have enough forces uh, and resources to fulfill that mission. Thank you. Mr. Watkins. When we think of national security, I think it's broken. It's typically uh, by people like me uh, who spend a lot of time thinking about it. It's broken into capability and will. So when you think of capability, you think of, uh, I first think of Russia, uh, which is the only country in the world with the nuclear capability to destroy the United States. However, they lack the, largely you can say they lack the will. Uh, China also uh, has incredible capabilities, but they're what I'd consider to be a rational actor, uh, much to a lesser extent Iran. Now, when you start looking at a uh, national security threat uh, to less rational actors, you're looking at uh, North Korea, you're looking at uh, radical Islamic terror, um, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and there's a, there's a whole collection of them um, that, uh, that do everything they can to disrupt uh, US operations in the region. And so. Um, and then when you think about bioterror or, or uh, uh, cyber terror, you're looking at modalities and not necessarily the actors. Uh, they could be state-sponsored or uh, individual actors. So, you know, when I think of uh, national security, um, I think, it, well, let me, let me say uh, North Korea, as, as a guy who's, uh, you know, been in the business of national security for many years, I look at North Korea and it, it, uh, it's always had me very worried uh, based off how their position, both their capabilities uh, to attack uh, allies as well as the will uh, to do so. So uh, that, uh, I don't stay up late at night, but that's, if I did, it would be uh, the North Korean. 
Karen, go ahead. Thank you. We have several items that are threatening our security as a nation, not just hostile foreign countries such as China, Russia, North Korea, but also illegal immigration. We need to stop illegal immigration. That is, it is threatening our security. You might not think so simply, but look at the gangs that are coming into our nation. Look at the diseases that they're bringing that we had eradicated as a nation. That is an issue that we need to talk about. Also, cybersecurity. I'm an IT software engineer. A business down in Fort Scott, Kansas gets a knock on their door. It's the FBI. They had been hacked by a group out of China and they were using their servers from Fort Scott, Kansas to bounce to government servers in our nation. We need to stop that. Our legislation needs to catch up with the technology. It is far behind and we need to address that. That is one of the items that I would work on. There are several other things that I would like to work on for security and that is supporting our military. We have a president who is finally willing to put the money into our military where it needs to be. That was a major threat to our nation. But this president is taking care of it, and I support that effort, and I will support that as your U.S. Congresswoman. It was our founders who said that, uh, that when it comes to security, uh, America is so strong, it could probably only happen from within. That's what, it's, that's what they said. And um, in, in today's day and age, I truly believe that the, the people who have their finger on the pulse of security, of defense, and just of life in our communities really is our local law enforcement, it's our sheriffs. And, uh, and so I made it a priority to go and to speak with those individuals and get to hear a lot of different things from a lot of different areas. Everything from, um, Meth, meth was a really, really big issue in our local communities, right? Still is, but now it's not being farmed. It's actually so cheap coming through Mexico that, uh, that they don't really cook it anymore up here. They just buy it cheap, you know? Um, everything from human trafficking to, um, to just relations, uh, relationships between um, the police department, the sheriff department, and, the, and things like that. Everything tends to fall back on our law enforcement. And that just brings me to mental health. It brings me to the insecurity that we're dealing with in the family unit. The greatest thing that we have in the second district is our families. It's why my parents moved here. When they both uh, graduated college, they got out of the Air Force, they met in the Air Force. If it wasn't for the Air Force, I wouldn't be alive. And they came back, they came to Leyloop, Kansas to raise their children. And they did that because Kansas is the best place for that. And the second district is where they landed. Thank you. Um, I will start with Mr. Watkins on this question. We'll go one minute each. Um, what accomplishment have you achieved that makes you the most qualified to be our U.S. representative? Thank you. When I look back at my life, I've uh, been blessed. I see, you know, I actually I woke up on second, but uh, I didn't hit a double because um, I was born in an Air Force base. Uh, my first memories were when Dad was stationed at Andrews. Uh, they grew up as poor farmers at Holden and Hutchinson, uh, uh, Dad and Mom respectively, and they outfitted me with heartland values that I took forth and helped grow a company, serve 10 years in the military, uh, fought in two wars, uh, and, and, uh, and, and started a, a family. So when I, when I look back, I, uh, I, I one thing that I always remember um, is, is where my values come from. These heartland values of treating people right, uh, working hard, and uh, living with dignity, and with, uh, with God in your heart, uh, there's what, there, what has driven me to, uh, to accomplish the things I have uh, in business, in military, and uh, in the outdoors, Arctic athleticism. So uh, my, I, I can't pick one, I'm just going to choose my values. What makes me the most qualified to be your congresswoman is my life experience and my legislative experience. Small business owner, rancher, software engineer, and successful legislator. I have had success in the Kansas legislature with working with others, changing the budget process. We have a spend it or lose it attitude. 
in our government. They start with a baseline budget, and if they don't spend it, they lose it by the end of the year. We changed that process in Kansas. We now have a performance-based budget. Also, also, wasteful spending. When I ran for office, I told you that I would find ways to cut the budget and save the taxpayer money. I did. One of the things I found was $30 million with no oversight in our budget. The legislative research did a paper on this and won a national award for it. I dig in, I read the bills, I look and do my research. And that's what we need, somebody that can get it done. <clears throat> What qualifies me to be a second district a congressman? I truly believe that the, that the biggest question, well, besides my covenant with my wife, I truly believe that the biggest um, question that we should be asking ourselves is, how is that person going to handle our money? I had a, I used to do the, the Robert Kiyosaki thing, which means I leveraged credit. Um, then my wife and I had an epiphany to the Dave Ramsey thing. We cut up 32 credit cards, completely debt free, bought our house cash, in Wellsville and bought another house cash. And by doing that, it's allowed me to be able to do, to, to serve. Um, we don't have a lot of overhead. Um, we've gotten rid of debt. One of the biggest things that we can do is get rid of debt. We have to put our foot down now, and I will be that candidate. The last thing, and I'm proud of this, is that in my political experience, I have not become a politician, one who uses deception and manipulation to better my career. I see this as a deployment and I'll get the job done and get right back. Lastly, I pick up my phone. Thank you for the question. Um, we have expounded on the answers that go a little bit afield from the question on occasion. I'm glad to see that that is now the most important problem that we see. And I think that is in fact the case. And I think the most important thing this Congress can do is to help keep down the deficit spending and to help keep us from breaking that debt. We have to reduce it. I've got a breadth of experience, as I mentioned, 20 years in the Army, 11 years with my own uh, business. Uh, I'm heavily invested in the future. My wife, Francie, and I, we've got five children, 19 grandchildren. Uh, dedicated myself to uh, serving my fellow citizens, which I've done and uh, I've done that in a number of ways as the vice president of the school board, as being in Kansas Senate, as being with the Republican Party. And for one thing, I've turned down any CAPERS uh, benefits because I'm not here for anything else than service. My oath that I took when I was 20 years old, I just turned 20, uh, maybe two months, uh, and uh, I took an oath to serve and protect this country. I continued that oath all the way through my military time and all the way through my Department of Justice time. I've been dedicated to keeping you safe and secure. My regional experiences that I have from having to deal with um, governments from state to state, <coughs> as a director would send me out to areas, be it that I end up in Detroit, a bit that I end up in Dallas, I have to be able to understand how to interact and gain um, cooperation from those that I'm working with down there, be it that it's the government official or if it's the criminal, and that's a little easier with the criminal, because um, I can just lock them up. Uh, <laughs> but my values, my character, my integrity, and my personal level of responsibility to you is what I feel will make me the best candidate. And this will be our last question for each of the candidates, and uh, we'll go one and a half minutes on this, this last question, and um, I'm trying to combine uh, a combination of several questions we've had um, presented here. So uh, when you think about if you're elected our representative, uh, will you put party over country, or what will you do to make sure you understand the voice of the district that you're representing in Washington? And, uh, Karen, I'll, I'll start with you, one and a half minutes. I'll represent the constituents of the second district much with the same manner that I do my Senate district. I will be involved, I will be engaged, I will listen to my constituents. When I ran for the House for this first time, my platform was limited government, individual freedom, 
traditional values, and economic development. You can take almost any bill and read that bill and know how I'm going to vote based off that platform. I'm proud to announce there's not very many, there's nobody in this race that's really well known with their names. And so the endorsements are important in this race. I am endorsed by Kansas Farm Bureau. I am endorsed by Kansans for Life and Susan B. Anthony List, which is another pro-life endorsement, national. I'm endorsed by the Madison Project, which is a national conservative group. Jim Ryan's endorsement. Also, I'm endorsed by, today, we just got the National Association of Kansas Realtors. Maggie's List, which is a fiscal conservative group. My actions, my words back up my actions. I say what I mean, and I mean what I say, and I get it done. We need somebody that is gonna take action and get results, not just complain about things, or not just put up their finger in the wind to decide how they're gonna vote on policy. We need somebody who's gonna be strong for Kansas and strong for the second district, and I am that candidate. We need somebody who's not in the party of no. We need somebody who will actually uh, be a part of our district, that will call this one, and that when they go to D.C., they will see it as a deployment. They'll come back and they'll listen. I have a vision, and I've spoken about it a few different times when I've been out, that just to come back, and we have coffees that we uh, regularly go to, um, that the chamber sets up and Farm Bureau sets up, but just to, just to come into a, uh, to a library group and just be there with five people, hear their hearts, where they're at, how they're trying to know well as well, they're trying to grow the library, trying to uh, raise money. They've been doing it for years and years. So just stopping in, being a part of that community, and that's what's so very important. And uh, when it comes to party over country, no. Um, the, the party, man, if I could tell you some of the stories. I, I didn't receive the Kansans for Life endorsement. Um, I've, I've been a co-sponsor on, on, on uh, Simon's Law. Uh, chief co-sponsor. I've been, I've, I have eight kids. Um, I've prayed at Tiller's Clinic, um, yet I didn't get the Kansans for Life endorsement. The three senators did, but I didn't. And what that means is that a lot of times political correctness is, is kind of the way that we go. The political correct thing to do is endorse the senators so when they are back in the House, at least two or three will be back in the, in the uh, Kansas State House, um, that you, get, you keep those votes, right? I struggle with political correctness, and the party sometimes struggles with me. But I'll do well to represent the people for the second district. Thank you very much. First off, I'd like to say that I think it's a shame that Kevin Jones did not get an endorsement from Kansas for Life, and I mean that very sincerely. Uh, few people uh, earn it more than he has. Um, I did get endorsed, I'm very proud of that. I helped to found the Kansans for Life chapter in Leavenworth uh, County a long time ago. Uh, I've had a lot of pro-life activity that I've been involved with, and uh, I think that uh, it, it's, I'm a little bit ashamed that they did not endorse uh, Representative Jones. How to stay in touch with the people. You listen, you talk to them. The main thing is, and I believe that I'm guilty of this more than almost anybody else, I will tell you exactly what I think and how I feel and why I think it. Uh, I have been chided for that publicly uh, by a number of, in the, uh, the media, but I hope not to be misunderstood and I would hope to get your reaction to me. I would hope to hear you tell me what you think is needed and I will listen to that and we will discuss it. And if we don't agree, I want to know why we disagree. Because maybe I'm wrong. And maybe you can make me smarter. And I've had that happen a lot by being very direct, very open, and very straightforward. When people come back and explain to me why they think I'm wrong, very often I find that they've got a very good position and has to be respected as we go forward. Uh, Thank you. First things first. Uh, the pastor told me that in church a couple of weeks ago, and I was thinking about that, and I began to look at what is the role of, of the federal government and what is the role of the state government. My job as a congressional member is to represent this district and do the best job I can. As I shared with you earlier, I spent time in different states and had to deal with different elected officials. 
and I know how touchy they get and how, how they are in terms of what they want done. Well, what it did for me is it set an excellent example for me in terms of how I'm going to represent people here in Kansas with my whole heart, soul, and mind. Uh, Kansas first, Kansas strong. When the director called me in my office in Kansas City and said, Vernon, you're going to Los Angeles, I said, really? I don't want to go there, but I went. And the director sent me there to do one thing, to kind of set a record straight. I walked into the office and someone took the president's picture of the United States and the, the attorney general picture and turned it around. I walked out of the office, I came back in, and I said, you very good. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back in this office and I expect you guys to show the same respect for that picture as for the person that served in the office, or you will be terminated. They got it loud and clear. That's how I would be in terms of representing people in the state of Kansas. I would be clear, I would be complete, I would be concise, I would be compassionate, and you will have no doubt whatsoever where I'm at in terms of is Kansas first? Yes, Kansas is first. Thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. Again, my name is Steve Watkins, and uh, I first serve the constituents. We listen to them every day. We knock on about a thousand doors a day, again, not to persuade, but to listen. And what we've heard has been awesome. People are ready for a change. They're ready to usher in a new generation of Republicans. But where do we get these values? We get them from the Founding Fathers. These, this ragtag, imperfect crew of Western revolutionaries believed in the same things that all basically drive our modern day Republicanism. So that's what we're hearing from the streets and from the phone calls, the conversations that we're having, and I'm proud of that. You know, we, these, our mission is to defend our country, protect our values, and uh, long ago, as young as I could, I raised my right hand to do just that. And I have, in two war zones. It's, it's been a wonderful life of service, and uh, God willing, I'll be able to continue that. So uh, please, if you'd like some more information, I'll stick around. My website is steveforkansas.com. Steve Watkins, thank you so much. <coughs> We did have some questions come in late, but we're uh, running up against the time, but I'm gonna have one last question for, for the, the panel right now. Um, and we'll go 30 seconds each on this. It'll be a pretty pretty brief question and answer. Uh, and I'll start with Kevin Jones on this question. Uh, what are your thoughts on term limits for Congress? Currently, I am the only person on stage that's term limiting myself to run for United States Congress and as well as I have signed a term limits pledge. Um, our founding fathers, well, just go to George Washington. George Washington term limited himself at two terms as president. If he had not, he probably would have become a king. Um, and so I, I believe that we should term limit ourselves from our heart. But ultimately, term limits are important. Um, and, uh, and again, um, I was a Green Beret. I was an airborne, um, airborne ranger. And ultimately, it's a deployment. Thank you very much. I've signed the uh, term limit pledge. Uh, there's a, a little bit of a concern. Um, I've term limited myself to three terms in Congress. Uh, there is also a, a movement to push for a term limit for three terms for everybody in Congress. The problem with that, without an exception for those who are appointed or elected to leadership, is that we could wind up with the Speaker of the House or committee chairs that have very little experience or knowledge. So I'm concerned about that. Thank you. The answer is yes. I'm 61 years old. I will be retired totally by the time I'm 64. Let's do the math. <laughs> but with that being said, I think it's really inappropriate to term limit without having somebody else groomed to come in from that particular party to continue the work forward. So we need to have somebody else in mind. Yes, I signed the term limit pledge, and uh, you know, when I think about term limits, or when I think about our contribution, every generation has paid uh, the, the price of freedom, the greatest generation, the baby boomers, silent generation. Um, my generation has fought in two wars, uh, but that, our greatest legislative contribution, in my opinion, term limits and balanced budget amendment. Yes, I believe in term limits. I'm the only one on the stage that was with a national group trying to create rules I was on the executive committee to, for a constitutional change to have term limits. I do agree with that. 
But my pledge is to you, my constituents. I filled out a term limit sur survey, and I will stick by that. But I, my pledge is to my constituents, and that's where I pledge to be. We need somebody that's going to stand strong for Kansas and Kansas <coughs> values. And yes, I do believe in term limits, and thank you very much for coming tonight. <laughs> and thank you for being here and, and giving us your time. I uh, appreciate your ability to be up here. Uh, we'll take a quick two-minute break. and. Uh, <laughs> We have uh, one unopposed candidate up here for the uh, House District 5, uh, Lacey Murphy. So we're going to give her a minute and a half uh, opening statement. And then um, after she's done, we'll have the, the rest of the candidates uh, with their question and answer for us. So Lacey, go ahead. Howdy. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me. I'm Lacey Murphy. I live near Lane, out in the middle of nowhere, down here in the 5th District, out south. And, um, I don't think I'm the lone Democrat in the room, but I might be. Um, <laughs> I am a U.S. Navy veteran, PTSD service connected, a uh, longtime radio engineer, uh, sum cum laude in political science, history, anti-terrorism. I've been around a long time, seen a lot of stuff, but uh, you know, this really isn't about me. It's about the people of the district and all across the state. And I can tell you what they told me they care about. Osawatomie State Hospital will not be dismantled. It will not be privatized. It will be our jobs center in Osawatomie. It will be protected. Another way that we're going to help facilitate that is with uh, expansion of pan care. Now, you, some of you are against that, but think about this. For every dollar we spend on it, we get nine in return automatically. You'd be crazy not to do that or just mean and stupid. Um, we also want less regulations on farmers. Um, some of them are just silly, and they gotta go. They're, again, they're just mean. We also want medical marijuana. I mean, when our schools paid for, they almost didn't open this year. We're not gonna let that happen again next year. And that's what the people I talk to care about. Thank y'all very much for letting me holler at you. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Appreciate it. Um, so the the questions. Uh, okay, can can you come on down? Because the questions that will be submitted will be for the for the other candidates. That's okay. I'll give you some of that coffee. Thank you. Thank you again. So we'll give each candidate a minute and a half with an opening statement. Uh, again, a reminder, if you have a question to submit for your candidates, uh, please grab one of the people walking around and uh, they'll get you a pen and paper and you can get it back to the end of the aisle. Uh, and then you know, make sure you, you mark down who the uh, uh, question is intended for. So, uh, Ms. Weber, I will let you begin in a minute and a half. Thank you. I'm Sherry Weber. I live on the south shore of Pomona Lake over by Vassar, which is part of the 59th district, a portion of Osage County, and a goodly portion of Franklin County. I'm running for public office because I care about the life that we hand off to our children. What they inherit is very important, so we need to be involved in the strength of communities and of agriculture and small business, and we need to be concerned about education, and particularly public safety. At the legislature, we break up the workload. Most of my experience um, as a legislator has been uh, in the appropriations process. Although it has included other subject matters, uh, certainly that is a definite priority. It does not matter how much we put into education if our children aren't safe. So we have to be very pragmatic about that. I value the trust of the people. One of the things that I enjoy the most about the legislative process is interacting with people because I remember what you tell me when I push the button. I'm a seasoned legislator. I've actually served five terms in the House, and one of them was as a House Majority Leader. So I am not unfamiliar with the process of listening to constituents and knowing the truth and telling the truth and being involved so that what your important things are are on my radar screen. And 
I, I apologize, I forgot to uh, explain that uh, Sherry Weber and William Fitch will be running for District 59, and Renee and Mark are running for District 5 for House of Representatives. So, Blaine, go ahead. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank the Chamber for hosting this forum. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Blaine Finch. Uh, I am a native Ottawan. My family has been here for five generations. Uh, there's not many folks in this room I don't think I, I don't know. I think I know almost all of you or run into you at some point at the grocery store or somewhere else around town. Uh, I have been honored to uh, be the recipient of investments made by prior generations in our community. A graduate of Ottawa High School and Ottawa University, went to Washburn School of Law and then took over a practice uh, down here that was run by a man named Bob Green and before him went winter for many years. And it has been an honor to serve my community in many different ways. City Commission and Mayor, County Councilor, as a private attorney and businessman who's helped create jobs, uh, and now in the state legislature as your state representative. And it truly is an honor to go to Topeka and to do the work of the people there. I can tell you that I think over the last six years I've amassed a record that you all can be proud of because I know I am proud of it. We've stood against sales tax increases and property tax increases. We stood against an income tax plan that had all of you paying more every time you went to the store so some people could pay nothing. Those are the kinds of things that special interest groups and lobbyists and shadow groups have spent a lot of money to try to attack me for. And I've stood up for you because I believe nothing is more important when you are a representative than to stand in the gap for the people that you serve and to do the best that you can for them. We may not always agree, but the one thing you'll always get with me is you will understand where I am at and you will have a firm explanation about why I came to the decision that I did and one that you can take to the bank. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hello, I'm Renee Slinkard, and uh, I'm a business owner. I uh, started a uh, business over 30 years ago, my husband and I, and um, we are currently semi-retired, and we have two children and four grandchildren, and also I am an ultrasound technologist. I've been that for a number of years, and I do public service as well as the ultrasound technologist. I also do community service by teaching the Constitution or presenting it in our schools, grades fifth through eight in a three county area. And I also uh, volunteer for commemorative events for our veterans. I, I feel that our veterans uh, should be honored and the families of the fallen in the MIA should also be honored for their, their grave sacrifice. What I would like to do is what our founding fathers would like to do and that is uh, their vision of limited government. I would like to go to Topeka and stop the spending uh, that's going on. Uh, we have way too much and it's been a long time since we've cut that spending. So I would like to do a zero baseline budget on every entity in the government and that way you're starting from scratch, you're seeing exactly the transparency of what is being spent. We don't have to do that every year, but we have got to do it. It's not been done for years. So they just keep spending. So thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, to our sponsors for having us here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Samsel, born and raised in Wellsville, Kansas. Blessed to grow up in this area with an entire community supporting me. Um, I've been an independent thinker for quite a long time, as my parents back there would uh, probably confirm. Uh, I, I've been. Uh, after Wellsville, I went through uh, Missouri Valley College, got my degrees there, worked my way, paid my way through school, came back, I'm a Jayhawk, although uh, I know Dean Wade's probably my favorite player, can't say that too loud with Jayhawk fans, but I got my law degree there uh, 2008 when we came in, got the Orange Bowl and national title, and then I've been practicing law since then. Uh, some of my coworkers would probably tell you we argue all the time at work, but actually problem solving is what I do day in and day out. I uh, really try to get the facts, understand the issues, uh, and then bring those skills um, many of you may have seen I'm a basketball referee in the area, uh, across uh, both districts actually. Uh, so I hear call up both ways quite frequently uh, from the stands, coaches, players even. So uh, I, I'm used to uh, being open on issues, but really when it comes down to uh, traditional re Republican values of making sure uh, we support our schools, uh, we've got to be efficient while we do it, but make sure they have the same opportunities here in the 21st century that I had when I came through Wellsville. Um, I, I, my principals here uh, honored to be able to take the things that he taught me and uh, use those. Uh, but then uh, solid infrastructure, uh, health care, mental health are big issues. 
Um, and so I'm honored to ask for your vote and have the opportunity to represent the people I care so much about. Thank you. Thank you all. And Mark, I'm just going to start back here with you. We'll go a minute and a half on this question for everybody. Uh, school funding. What are your ideas to get funding um, back up with the state? Yeah, that's a great question, and I appreciate it. It's actually one of the main reasons um, I felt like I couldn't sit on uh, the sidelines anymore, not to keep using sports analogies, but uh, the direction we were going with our state since about 2012, uh, I mean, I, with four years of undergrad in Missouri, I saw the alternative uh, when we don't support our schools. I know it's not all about money, and we've got to have community support. Uh, and it's when I get out and I talk to our educators in our district, uh, I'm so proud to be a part of and help grow uh, a lot of our Votech um, opportunities in addition to college. I mean, we've got welding, HVAC, automotive that we're partnering with community colleges uh, and other schools in our area, but making sure we support those um, and we support our teachers through the process. So education uh, across the board, um, we've, we've moved in the right direction the last two years, um, and we're about there. The Supreme Court, I mean, I'm an attorney, I, I, I read most of the decision, it was a pretty lengthy one, and the, the high points on it is we're close to getting this, the problem solved, uh, but we can get that done within the next session or two, and I don't want to go back to where we were uh, for the prior six years on that. Um, that that's critical to me, I've heard it over and over across our district, we need to be efficient, uh, but we need to make sure we support our students. Uh, so again, that we can have those same opportunities that when we came through our public schools um, and private schools and even home schools, I want to support all levels, uh, but not at the expense of our public schools. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to see the judges stop <clears throat> legislating from the bench and saying how much money goes into the schools. That's a legislative issue, and it should remain in the legislature. Also, I believe that the schools, the money that we have right now in the schools should be directed toward classroom learning and quality teachers. We are not doing that. The money is going in other directions. So we need to get back to what truly education is all about. And that is in the classroom. I do agree with Mark though on the trade. I do believe that not all students want to go to college or can afford to go to college. So this would be a way, but we need to get in-depth trade in the schools, and the only way that those students can get out and get a job is for businesses to interact with the schools and have clinicals, what you would call clinicals, or training right there on the job site. So that's one of the things that I would like the money to be directed toward is that, and uh, classroom learning. Thank you. Thank you. The, over the past three legislative sessions, the state legislature has put $815 million more dollars into public education. Uh, this year we were told by the courts that there has to be even more put in. Uh, that inflation number, folks, is somewhere between $320 and $500 million on top of the $815 that's already been put in. So you're looking at $1.1 to $1.3 billion. So when candidates for the legislature tell you they don't like state spending, understand that the lion's share of it is to comply with the court's order to put more money into education. That's why I supported a constitutional amendment this session, passed it out of my committee, the House Judiciary Committee, and in fact was extensively involved in drafting it, to try to put the question back before the public. Who do you want to make the final decision about how much money gets spent on education in Kansas? Not whether it's equitably distributed, but how much is enough. I think that you all should have a voice in that process because currently you don't. The court makes that decision and the legislature has to comply with it and now that's going to be to the tune of over a billion dollars. Education has traditionally been about 50 percent of the state's general fund. After this billion to billion three, it will be about 60 percent of the state budget that gets spent on K-12. I think our teachers try to do yeoman's work and they do a good job trying to educate our kids. I think we do need to focus on VOTEC, but we also have to have balance amongst all the other parts of our budget. We can't put all of our eggs in that one basket, and I think you all should get to weigh in on that. And that's what I've been about when it comes to education funding in the legislature. Thank you. I believe the question is what would I do as a legislator, is that correct? Yeah, to help school funding. Much the same that I did uh, during the other terms that I served. 
I would agree that we need to follow the Constitution, but the Constitution says the legislature will make suitable provision for finance. And so the legislature does make suitable provision for finance. It's just that in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, we have gotten a court system into this because the schools have sued the legislature. And that's a little bit like suing your mother. So it probably would be better to focus on something constitutional oriented, but specifically to solve the problems, you have to be respectful to everyone around the table. We've done this before with other things like juvenile justice, but we've not had what we've needed. We've asked for stakeholders on a local level to come together and to share with us what needs to be done. Then those of us who have the people's trust and represent we have to sit down probably in select small groups and figure out how we're gonna solve this problem because it does have to be solved and there are a number of different ways. I don't think any of us knows exactly how it's going to get done, but it is going to get done because we need to do it for our children. We want them to inherit a good quality of life. Okay, well, we have one minute uh, on this next question for, for each candidate. May I'll, I'll start with you. How can Kansas live on a balanced budget and not overspend? Well, it's simple, just like every family. You don't spend more than what you take in. It's just as simple as that. I would like to, to bring common sense back to Topeka, and I think it starts with cutting the budgets, and that starts with zero baseline budget. We need to start cutting. And then you can see the transparency. Put in the bucket what you truly need for your sp you to, to spend on what's really truly needed. And that's for all government entities, including schools. Then put your little bucket over here of what you want. But that bucket that needs to show should show what you truly need, and that will show transparency. We have got to get back to common sense. We are not there, but we need to get back to it. Thank you. Thank you. We have started some zero-based budgeting at the state. I was in support of that. We've got a couple of departments that are using zero-based budgeting. Also supported implementation of over 29 of the Alvarez and Marsal efficiency study recommendations to reduce spending and improve efficiency in state government. And there are another 24 that are under review and partial implementation at this time. So a big part of what we have to do at the state level is obviously this education piece, because it's up to 60% of the state budget, and we've got to get that figured out. We talked about that in the last question. I think we've got to continue to drive for efficiency and continue to push for reforms that will promote that type of efficiency. When I came to Topeka, we were bonding and using highway funds to pay for state operations. The state was living on the credit card. Today, we actually have a reserve of about $300 million, which is less than 3% of the state budget, but we do have a rainy day fund for the first time, and I'm proud of the work that we've done to restore some fiscal discipline in Topeka, and I think we need to go back and do more work uh, to try to keep taxes down for people and have uh, a, a, an efficient and sound budget. And so basically, the question about the budget. Yeah, how can Kansas Thank live on a balanced budget and not overspend? Spending at the legislature happens because whatever comes in gets spent. And so sometimes cutting the revenue stream is the best way to get a hold on things. We've done some things the last couple of years, and I've not been in the legislature during that time, but we've started looking at the budget in a longer period of time. Instead of just doing one year, it's doing two years. I think that's a good start. You also have to think about the fact that uh, accountability-wise, we need to look at data-driven outcomes, and so the next year we don't fund something that isn't giving us the outcome that we thought it was going to give us last year and we need to do more of that. That costs extra money because you have to track it, but it's the best way to figure out if what you're spending is actually doing the good that you want it to do or accomplishing the outcome you want. I think I've got two points on that. One is grow our economy and create more jobs. And what I've learned from working with so many businesses across the state and my role as an attorney is tax rates are important, but more important what our employees
employers are looking for and small and large businesses both quality of life which means we've got a solid infrastructure we've got quality schools and we've got a fair and balanced tax system we got that out of whack in 2012 uh, folks I work with on a daily basis down the hall were paying zero percent income tax and we weren't getting a reward for it in Kansas all that money was going to other states so we weren't supporting our schools we weren't supporting our mental health we weren't supporting our tax structure we've got to get back to those basics and then target tax relief on property tax sales tax particularly on food so it helps the folks at the middle uh, and lower end of the food chain and they're actually putting that money back into the economy uh, our friends and neighbors at the top didn't need the tax break and it didn't help us and we can't go back there in this election that's one of the reasons I'm running um, so growing the economy and creating jobs um, especially when the house district 5 construction is one of our big areas We'll go a minute and a half each on this next question, and, and Malay, I'll start with you on this question. Do you favor the expansion of CAM Care and taking the administration of it out of the hands of a private for profit administrator? CAM Care expansion is an issue we talked a lot about in some of the legislative coffees. If you were there, I, I voted no on CAM Care expansion or Obamacare expansion, depending on what side of the aisle you're on, how you describe it. Point. The, the very simple point about that expansion is that we can't afford it. We're told that it's budget neutral, that it's revenue neutral, but the reality is even the hospital association's numbers show that it's not. And that all we would be doing is promising people care that we may not be able to afford. It's always nice to believe that we can take money with no strings attached from the federal government and they will continue to uphold their end of the bargain forever. But if you trust the federal government, folks, I've got a bridge I can sell you. And the reality is, that we would take that money and in short order the feds would reduce their reimbursement percentage and, and Kansas would be left paying more and more and more. One of the famous uh, sayings in the, in the state government world is you can be an education state or you can be an expansion state but you can't be both. Uh, and Kansas right now is very much an education state and we are not an expansion state. And many of the states who are trying that are seeing their budgets get blown because the projections are not there. And we cannot seem to get the hospital association or any other group to come back and say, hey, we're willing to look at a more red state model that has some budget pay fors in it, and I can't support a plan that's going to put us that far underwater. I have supported trying to protect Medicare for our seniors. I have supported an interstate compact that would be an alternative to Obamacare and would allow a Kansas-specific solution for our health care. Uh, but I've not seen an expansion bill yet that I think is deserving of support when it's going to be placed on the backs of all of us to have to pay for it. Well. I too would not support an expansion of can care and not because I don't think that we need to take care of the children because we do. In fact, I believe the measurement of our society is how well we take care of young children and older people. And those are the very population that needs those services. So there has to be some public private partnerships going on. Again, somewhat within the community, somewhat with uh, parameters and funding from the state. But what government can't give is compassion. And so that compassion has to come from the people in the area where they live, and then we have to partner with the resources of the state. We can figure that out. One of the things we've done uh, as a legislature, we took the tobacco litigation funds and put them aside for children. It's in a trust fund and it's spent every year. There's a committee that makes recommendations to the governor. And much of that money has gone towards what you would call a minus nine months to uh, two, three, four years because of the brain development and the needs of children during those ages. And I think that that's one area where we could focus. And again, we're working off of data driven outcomes, so that would be helpful. Um, I'm probably only, actually, I, I think I'm going to be the only candidate up here. I'm absolutely yes in favor of uh, the expansion. Now, it's got a scary term. It's called Medicaid or Obamacare, depending on which side of the issue on. Uh, but I've met with our hospital administrators. I've gone door to door and met our Kansans. Um, and a majority of Republicans and Democrats did pass this. Um, we hit a, a governor veto, fell three votes short. Uh, but what does this do at the end of the day when you actually look at the facts and get rid of the terminology? Uh, it would help 150 Kansans who we see door-to-door -door 
have uh, access to insurance coverage that they don't have right now, um, and at the end of the day, they wait, go to the hospital later, increase the cost that you and I end up paying for anyway, and it actually costs more. I've done collections for hospitals, and when they, they put it off, we end up picking up all that overhead and everything else on top of it. Um, I've worked with the Kansas Hospital Association, and again, learning from the folks on the ground who encounter this day after day, it creates 3,800 new jobs for us here in Kansas. There's 30 rural hospitals that are financially burnable. Uh, Independence would be an example. Uh, the, the hospitals are critical to our local communities, like we've got here in Ottawa and Garnett. And then as an example, I compare it to, again, when you get rid of the scary terminology, but uh, the federal government, they do need to fix it, and with this is just a temporary solution, but transportation and education dollars we take from the federal government, nine to one, they would pay for this. Uh, so just one dollar to every nine that the, the federal government chips in, and that really, it spurs our economy, it helps our fellow neighbors that are in most need, um, folks who couldn't otherwise afford coverage. Thank you. Well-meaning people think that government is the answer to everything. Unfortunately, it is not. And I agree that we should not expand CanCare. However, we are spending money in Topeka, so to speak, $400 million a year. We have been spending since probably Sebelius was governor. That's 2004 on illegal aliens. We could take that money and use it towards citizens' help. And maybe that might be an answer to some help in the healthcare field, or we could give it back to a disabled veteran, or just put it back in our pockets. But I do think there is wasteful spending, and until we get that under control, we cannot spend more. I'm sorry. So, uh, we talked about uh, budgets earlier and, and um, uh, zero-sum budgets and, and spending, but uh, one of the questions is related to taxes uh, and the revenues that the state has. What are your thoughts on the appropriate sources of taxes when you think about property tax, income tax, or state income tax? And uh, we'll go one minute each on this question, and I'll, I'll start with uh, Mrs. Worker. Thank you, Blaine. Uh, Blaine and I have history together. He was an intern when uh, I was House Majority Leader, so we're used to working together. <laughs> the taxation piece is that tax is tax, fees are fees. And so you have to be cognizant of all of that. As Representative Finch said, we spend over 50% of the budget on K-12 ad. So we're gonna to have to figure out how we're going to fund that. Initially, it was a third, a third, a third, like a three-leg stool. Uh, but property tax elevating it does nothing for agriculture, our number one industry. And so I would be adverse to that. Sales tax uh, usually hurts the people with the least amount of money. So then you're looking at income tax, and it's good to be fair to everyone. It's a quandary, but I am, I'm a fiscal conservative. The last place I would look is to elevate taxation. The first place I look, would look would be to make us more efficient and effective in our spending. Well, Kansas has traditionally been described as a three-legged stool, property tax, sales tax, income tax. Uh, and I told you in my opener that I've opposed efforts to increase the property tax, and I have, and I've opposed efforts to increase the sales tax, and I have. And I opposed a plan that had people paying a disproportionate share of their income while other people paid nothing. Uh, and I think that the changes that have been made to the income tax system over the past couple of years have been helpful. I think they went a little farther than I would have liked. Uh, but we couldn't get uh, the governor to sign off on a plan that, that we supported that kept two income tax tiers. I think we need to work now on reducing the sales tax. Uh, the sales tax on food is amongst the highest in the country. It needs to come down. The sales tax is up. It was uh, passed in 2015 to increase it. I oppose that, but it stayed up ever since, back when we were in a uh, slump because of the income tax plan. That has to come down so that when people go to the store, they're not penalized, paying almost 10% in sales tax. We have to, to hold the line on property tax, uh, and, and we need to bring sales tax down, and I think we can probably dial around the income tax just a little bit, but uh, that's what we need to go next. I, I believe 
that um, from just talking with all of my constituents going door to door, that this is a major concern is taxes. And the sales tax now is about ninth in the nation, Kansas. I think property tax is probably about 15. And I think the income tax is probably somewhere in the middle. So we are one of the highest states in the nation on taxing. I would love to see the taxes decrease. I think we have to get back to cutting spending and that way maybe the taxes will come down. Now, we do need to grow our economy and I think through business and getting back to um, uh, low tech and also reducing regulations on businesses and all the red tape that they have to go through, the insurance, maybe we could cut that, I don't know, but if we can try, and that way it would free up productivity and we would have economic growth. Yeah, I could actually shorten my answer probably, which you guys might appreciate if you're wanting to get home, but my answer is very similar to Blaine's actually. Um, and what I would add with that, I mean, the, 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 what got out of whack with the three-legged stool is when we tried our 2012 tax cuts, uh, we yell and cheer because we think we're getting tax cuts, but what it really did is hit most of us the hardest in our property taxes that you saw go up and then our sales tax go up. And again, my partner is down the hallway. I mean, I sat in a senior government class and we talked about this issue and we asked, well, what do you think my secretary pays in her taxes? And it's about a 6% rate. And that's what their answer was. What do you think I paid? 6% taxes. Well, what do you think my partners made who were making three, four, five times more than uh, I was and certainly a lot more than my secretary? Their answers were about 6% is what they thought. The real answer was 0%. That's what we did in Kansas and we can't go back to that. So our tax rates, when you look at the facts, are actually income still lower than where we were uh, when Brownback started those. Uh, but we don't need to raise anything at this point, but where we can get the relief is uh, sales and property tax. Okay, well th thank you all again for being here this evening. That's all the questions we had uh, for the uh, Kansas representative <laughs> candidates. Uh, appreciate you being here. We'll go ahead and switch and have the Franklin County Commission candidates come on board. get started with the Franklin County Commission candidates. We have uh, two different races. Uh, District 5 is Don Stoudemire and Randy Renown. And District 4 is uh, Richard Murphy <coughs> and Ian Dickinson. Uh, candidates, same same deal. You get one and a half minutes with an opening statement and then, and then we'll answer uh, questions. Again, if you have any questions to submit, uh, get your hand up and we'll get them, get them turned in. So, uh, Rick, I'll let you Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you all for staying. I know it's been a long night. Uh, first, I just want to tell you a little bit about me. I, uh, I've been in Franklin County for the last 39 years. I started out uh, my life working in road construction, so I got some experience in road construction. And then I got into law enforcement with the Department of Public Safety as a patrol officer that and, uh, led to a promotion that got me into the dispatch room, so I got some dispatch experience, and then a transfer to the fire side. And the fire side led me into uh, working into EMS as well. So overall, I got a lot of vast experience in different areas throughout my career: you know, law enforcement, fire, EMS, road construction. All of those are very important tools to this position, and. I got appointed 19 months ago to this position uh, by the Central Committee and then by the Governor. And it's been my pleasure to serve the citizens of Franklin County. And one of the biggest things that I, I choose to do is I want to be an advocate that promotes our county to be one of the best counties in the state of Kansas, a place where people want to live, work, retire, and raise their kids. Thank you. I think at this point in the evening, if I just went yada, 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 you'd all just be sitting there with your blood uh, But for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ian Dickinson. I grew up in Carolina, Kansas. I got a business administration degree from Bartlesville Wesleyan College. Um, out of college, my husband and I moved 
moved to Ottawa. Um, we've been here, residents of the county, for 30 plus years. <clears throat> we've lived in both Ottawa and in the in rural Franklin County. I've been a realtor for over 22 years. My husband's a minister, um, and he also works part-time as the chaplain for the Sheriff's Department and works for Dengel and Son uh, Funeral Home. I'm running for county commissioner because I feel like the citizens of the county have become disconnected with their current uh, local officials. As a county commissioner, you need to be both a leader and a servant. Because when you vote on issues at the county level, you aren't just voting for yourself. You need to be voting for the people of your community. Um, I'm not sure that the people of the community right now know who their county commissioners are. I've talked to several hundred of them in the last month, and if I ask them, most of them can't tell me who their commissioner is. Another thing is, what, as we move forward with the, with the development of uh, Proximity Park, as well as any other, um, My name's Randall Renaud, and if you want all the uh, nitty gritty on me, it's on a piece of paper in the back of the room, and you're welcome to read that. Don't trust the Google answer you'll get. I was elected to the position four years ago, and let me tell you that I think it's all about quality of life. The commissioner's role is about quality of life. And as a county commissioner, and I know I'm elected from the 5th District, but I represent everybody in Franklin County. It's about housing, it's about employment, it's about health care, it's about law enforcement, it's about roads. All the infrastructure we need, whether it's a house of worship, child, affordable child care, to schools or recreation, this county is only going to move forward when we look at the quality of life for the citizens that are here and those that may come here and choose to be here, whether it's to work in Park City Park or wherever it might be. So the role of this uh, commission is to do those things that will promote that quality of life. We implemented a pay plan this uh, in the last four years that will uh, improve salaries for our county employees. We've uh, Obviously, got the 300 acres started on the Proximity Park. We've uh, moved 911 into uh, dispatch into the county administration so we can save some money. We've actually made so, several personnel changes that have consolidated positions or eliminated positions that resulted in a savings of $237,000. We're in the process of clearing some delinquent tax properties. We're also uh, trying to cross train our employees so that we have better efficiency and also better service to the citizens of this county. It's my pleasure to have been elected to this position, and I hope to continue to do so. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Don Stoudemire. I did serve as your county commissioner for 14 years, and uh, through that period of time, I think uh, I can gladly say I never voted one party or another on thousands of votes. It's always for the good of the community, is what my uh, vote was always for. and. Uh, uh, I think probably one of the most proud of times of being the 14 years as the commissioner the last year I served, I was nominated by the Franklin County employees for uh, County Official of the Year, and I was made the Kansas County Official of the Year for that year. And I think that's important that you, your, 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 uh, your employees and your people look at you as just another, you're just another one of the employees. That's what you are as a county commissioner. You're just, you lead by good intention and good things. And uh, I like to say I only missed three meetings in 14 years as a county commissioner. And so I look back a year uh, at what the county commissioner did last year uh, on meetings. They actually canceled 14 meetings last year. That's almost 20% uh, of the meetings they canceled. And I talked to a lot of other counties around and it's just rare that that happens, that type of thing, how, how you can continue to uh, improve yourself and work and uh, make a better life for your community if you don't even have to cancel a third of the meetings that you have. Okay, thank you all. Uh, I and I'll start with you on this question and uh, we'll go a minute and a half each on this question. What do you see as the biggest issue facing the county in the next four years? The biggest issue probably is still the development uh, and implementation of the Proximity Park. Um, it's close to being ready to go, but I, 
we still need to look at the big picture. Um, we get a new company in and we need to have qualified workers. And we get qualified workers in and we need to have housing <coughs> available. And I can tell you as a realtor, there is no housing available. So I mean, every, every issue that we have, we have to look at the big picture. One of the things that uh, the commission is just starting to work on is um, some maintenance issues that have been uh, neglected or put uh, back. And I think that's one thing that they're gonna, this is gonna have to be a priority because I don't know, as a homeowner, if you let things go, um, then it costs more in the, in, the, in the future. And that's a good thing that, they're, that they are working on that. So a couple of things. And then the budget's always the big thing. This year, it's, uh, you know, they've kept it on an even keel and try to keep all the services available. Um, as, a, as a new commissioner, those were all things that came. I think the tax lid on the uh, county budget will be probably the main concern for the next four years. We will have to work very diligently with the uh, monies that we have and also the efficiency then of the employees because I agree that we do not want to reduce county services. In fact, I have some goals listed that I would love to see us start working on. Uh, capital improvements is definitely on the list. We've already started targeting those and putting a replacement repair schedule and plan. Uh, that, that's big and crucial for us to do that. So we're going to have to stockpile some money back for some of the big target items, courthouse repair, the district court building, and some others. But managing the budget, uh, the efficiency of our staff, looking at ways in which to consolidate staff or uh, make things more efficient, whatever it might be, we're going to have to do that in order to uh, stay within our tax lid and the budget. Uh, taxes are a big thing, but obviously that's where our services come from is tax money. Yeah, I feel uh, we need to get back to some of the things we used to do that were eliminated here in the last two or three years. I know we used to have the County Highway Improvement Program, which we established back when I was a commissioner. We had a representative, one from each township that served on this board, and they brought recommendations and met with our uh, uh, public work director. And then every month uh, they would have a meeting and they'd invite the other townships in to, uh, to coordinate and bring us just like a planning board for zoning and during that time I was here we did 60 miles of hard surface road in Franklin County and the last year we've done zero uh, and also uh, they talk about the, they're talking about repairs on the courthouse down there I tried to get with their uh, the new director down there and give him some ideas we did receive three ninety thousand dollar grants while I was a commissioner to do work on the courthouse so you need to get out there and, and dig for those things I know uh, money tight, but if, but if you really get out there and look, uh, you know, you can find those things. I know when I was a commit, when I was a chairman in 2005, I know uh, times are always different, but we did cut the mill levy by nine and a half mills the year I was a chairman in 2005. And we stayed below that level for the next five years. So, and it was all about uh, just really looking deep into our county, what we could do to change things, and that was right in the middle of losing five hundred thousand uh, dollars demand transfer from the state at that time too. Sure. The uh, one of the biggest things that's going to hit every local government is going to be the tax lid. It's going to be that we have to find efficiencies. We have to find better ways to use the money that that we're given uh, to properly take care of what we have. I'm a big, strong advocate for maintenance taking care of the buildings and, and things that we have so that they don't deteriorate. They're gonna be here for generations to come. But I'm also a big advocate for taking care of our employees because when you lose an employee, you lose all of the training that they had. You lose all the time you invested in them and it takes a long time to recoup that. So there are some big things that need to be done. The other big thing that I really think is important is changing the culture of Franklin County so that we all become ambassadors for what this county can be to attract people to come and live here and have their business here and want to and want to invest in our community and i think that's the biggest thing i see is changing that culture and thought process so that people start to promote our county in a much better way thank you all and 
So Don, I'm going to start with you on this question. We'll go one minute each on uh, the question because you did address this topic in your in your statements. Uh, what are your thoughts on bringing back that chip program or the county highway improvement program? Well, like I said, I was here when that was all formed and back then, and I think it was a great idea. And I, and I understand financials may not allow to do what you could back then, but, but the township thought it was a great deal. They were actually being involved and in uh, the process of, of maintenance on the roads and the bridges and the gravel and the drainage and the, you know, instead of one person having to come in and complain to the public work director, you actually had a whole township of representatives that was able to meet once a month with the public work director and then several people on that board were uh, engineers and architects and, and just uh, other aspects of roads that belonged on that that donated their time uh, a free, uh, you know, will. And I just thought it worked really good. And uh, like I said, it brought in a lot of good ideas. And uh, I think the township and the committees uh, were devoted to make it real good. Sure. I'd love to see that program come back because it did a lot of good for uh, a lot of county roads. The big issue becomes the tax lid once again. That, that with that lid in place, you're not going to be able to increase the amount of property taxes to take care of that and take care of everything else that we already have for services that we're providing for the citizens of Franklin County. The way that we can accomplish this is, is that down the road, as we grow our tax base and the valuations go up, then we have more money to do those kinds of projects. But it, as it sits right now, there's just not funds available to do that and to take care of what we have currently. I think as you look at the counties around us, a lot of counties, look at Miami County, they have a lot more uh, roads that are paved or not gravel than we do, but it just comes down to money. Um, and then you need to maintain the ones that you, that you have already chipped and sealed. You know, if you go out and uh, you don't repair the potholes and you just put the asphalt over it, you know, it doesn't. So I think, you know, you maintain what you have, you pay for what you can. Um, you can't spend money you don't have. I'm going to go out on a limb. I got an email within the last week from one of the county officials that said the chip program started in 1997. Uh, Mr. Stolmeyer, I don't remember exactly when you started commissioner, but it was, I think, somewhere around 2000. And that program ended in 2000, I'm going to guess 11, 12, somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe 10, which was three years before I became a commissioner. That program ended. I was told because that the commission did not appoint people to that board that their terms expired. There was two mills at that time designated from the budget to that program. That was eliminated during that time as well. Uh, I have three goals listed for in the next four years. The number one goal is road improvement plan, including countywide study of speed limits. <coughs> Miami County has looked at that and I've presented that a copy of every road, every mile determine what would be an appropriate speed limit for those roads in our county and also the condition of the road. If that means improving them, if we want to go to a designated mill levy for that project, I'd be all for it. Thank you. Speaking of mill levies, uh, and Rick, I'll start with you on this question. We'll go one minute each again on this. Um, as a county commissioner, what do you believe you can do to decrease or drop the mill levy? Sure. I think the biggest thing is we can't keep looking for efficiencies so that we have the right people in the right places. And whether that means combining some of those positions or whether that means uh, we, we look for the right personnel. Shortly after I took this position, we were interviewing candidates for the uh, administrator. And as we looked at those candidates, we, we settled on one candidate. He, he simply priced himself out of the range. And we realized very soon that I wasn't going to just settle for somebody to fill that position. I wanted the right fit, the right person. And I think that's the key to, to finding the, the efficiencies that we need in the mill levy is, is making sure that we have the right people in the right place. I think that when we make decisions on spending money, 
um, that we take the time to do the research. Sometimes you, there are cheaper ways to do the same thing. Um, you don't always go with what, what you've always done. You know, sometimes you need to look at different options, newer options. Sometimes they'll save you money. Um, my son was actually a, a city commissioner and he said that they were looking for uh, concrete and asphalt. And so they put out a bid for concrete and asphalt. And somebody said, well, why don't you put out a bid for concrete to the concrete companies and a bid for asphalt to the asphalt companies? And they did, and they saved a whole lot of money. You know, you gotta think of maybe outside the box. Maybe not do it the way you've always done it. Come up with new ideas to save money. And I think personnel, definitely you need to look at personnel. Um, what Richard said about training people, keeping people, that's important. Um, so you gotta, thank you. I think the most important thing is to improve our tax base, and we're gonna do that by adding industry. Proximity part may be a ways down the road. We have some of our industries like American Eagle coming back on from the taxes force, which is going to help us a lot. We can't stand still and continue to improve services, continue services under the tax lift. The only way you're going to do it is improve your tax base. So we're going to have to bring in growth of some type to the county in order to do that. Or else we have to give something up. The easiest way, not the easiest way perhaps, but the most reliable way is to increase the tax base with a new industry, new businesses. I guess, uh, Mr. Oglesby said, we need to be ambassadors for this county. We need to have a quality of life and people out here promoting our county and let people who come to our county say, wow, this is a nice place. We want to put our business here. And I've heard of examples of that a couple of past meetings that I was at where they said that's why they located in Franklin County. They saw what they liked and what they heard and the people that were there. All of us need to be ambassadors for Franklin County. Yeah, uh, actually I was here when we started Proximity Park, it didn't have that name, but uh, we, were, we were able to uh, work with the city, and that was a very good working relationship all that time we went with the city, and uh, we'd actually pay our part in cash, we had money set back, so where we didn't have to. And that's what you got to do budget-wise, is try and plan ahead of time. I know when we did the, uh, we're playing on the uh, detention center, went through several years of study and work, and we were very fortunate when the, when the college closed out here, and we was able to purchase that at a very minimal amount to what it would have cost to build a new one, and we was able to also supply uh, sheriff's county attorney spaces and lots of different things. So a lot of it is figuring out how to use what you have to make it work better. And I know we started the, the dual administrator council job, and she also was our financial person with about fifty thousand dollars less than what they're doing now. This is the last question I have uh, for for the group of you, and uh, we'll go a minute and a half on this this last question with each of you. And, and Randall, I'll start with you first. Um, think about how you would describe your leadership style if you were elected to represent your district as the county commissioner. Well, on my paper, I listed leadership. It seemed like from the time I was a senior patrol leader in Scouts to uh, president of the High School Athletic Association, all through my life, uh, leadership roles seemed to come that way. Obviously, it's because you relate to people. I think Mr. Sotomayor mentioned that about the peers. Uh, when your peers see in you the opportunity to do that, it's because you listen and because you communicate. And if I'm going to be a leader of this community, it's my job to know the issues, what's going on, and to listen to the people in that community and also to communicate what's going on with them. Whether that's uh, going back to uh, pushing for an annual or semi-annual meeting of all the elected officials from all the cities and towns and townships in the county to come together. That would be a good start for that. We have to support the uh, people in Lane and Williamsburg and Richmond and Princeton, all these other areas outside. The county has to make sure that we can uh, be of assistance to those people who do not have that means to do all the things they need to keep our cities going. We need to consider the fact that Franklin County includes Ottawa. That is part of Franklin County. And we need to make sure that we're acting as a county and communicating with those people as well, one-on-one, -on -one, and making sure that uh, ears are there to listen and then to uh, repeat back what we can. Yeah, I, uh, I, well, I was a commissioner. I ain't gonna say I started it. I just got started doing it, attending the three, uh, communities and uh, my uh, 
city commissions that are in my district. And uh, I know the first meeting, I always remember I attended, a gentleman come up to me and asked me, I can't give you the direct word, but he said, what are you doing here? And uh, I said, I'm here because I'm your county commissioner and, and I need to be here. So listen, to be able to answer your question, be able to go back to the other commissioners and tell them what your needs are. And he was always the first guy to come up to me after every meeting after that and shake my hand and thank me for coming to that meeting. And uh, I, I am proud to be on a county commission board, uh, one of the first county commission boards to ever graduate all five county commissioners from the State Leadership Academy all at one time. We all awarded that award at one time. And I think we all took uh, credit uh, then of being very close to the employees, close to our constituents. And uh, I think I pride myself in it. Like I said, I go back to, to the employees uh, nominating me for a statewide award. And I said, usually county commissioners aren't the most popular person with the county employees. So I was very proud of that. Not that I want it, but because of who put me up for it. That's probably the easiest question tonight for me to answer. And my leadership style is the same leadership style that I've lived my life by. And that is that I'm a servant leader. I've always been and I always will. And that's just the way that I live my life. I've volunteered for many things. I've been involved in many uh, different organizations, given my time. I, I currently volunteer over 30 hours a week to my local church as an associate pastor without pay. I give my time to many other boards that I've done over the years. It's my life that I, I feel like that's the way that I live it, is that I live it as a servant to this community. And I've done that on the leadership board uh, for Franklin County. I've done that for Main Street. I've done that for the Ottawa Planning Commission. I've done it for many organizations. That's just who I am. I've been involved with a lot of different things, uh, helping people. I've gone to Princeton City Commission uh, meetings to hear what they have to say and to hear what's going on in their, in their community. I try to listen. I'm available if people want to contact me. It's very difficult to, to start calling everybody in your district to get their opinion. But it is very easy for you to contact the commissioner. And, uh, that's, I think, the key is, is being a servant, and that's what I am. Repeat the question, please. Sure. Um, Think about how you describe your leadership style if you were elected to represent your district as the county commissioner. In my current position, I work with people uh, in finances in making probably the biggest uh, purchase of most people's lives. Um, I am not, I like to research when I'm making a big decision and um, just to see what all the options are. I don't uh, have a problem with going against the status quo. One of the things that I do think about me, though, that if I vote no for something, and everybody else votes yes, when I walk out of the room, I'll support it. I'm going to support um, the commission. I'm going to support um, the decisions that are made. I'm going to support the citizens of Franklin County. And I am going to promote uh, Franklin County. John just handed me a note and said that my wife has not given the kids baths yet, so I need to delay this a few more minutes before I go home. Um, uh, we did have one last question I wanted to ask, ask the, the four of you, and we'll go, uh, we'll go one minute each on this. Um, and uh, Don, I'll just start with you on the end here. What are your plans uh, or thoughts to upgrade Old Highway 50? Old well, Highway 50. Okay, that's been, that's been something that's been uh, put on and off time and time and time again. Uh, and I know there were several uh, during, during my process here that it was on the list of different highways and it just didn't get uh, the vote. Not that I wasn't uh, in favor of doing it or not doing it. It's just one of those kinds of things that uh, uh, if we can find the funding and back where we made, they, they made the mistake years ago is when they had the, the Coke guaranteed road. And I kind of complained about it. It runs from 68 Highway to Rancho when they did it, the 15-year guaranteed road. And I kind of sneered, you know, that, this guy just silly. 
That's one of the best things the county ever did. And they should have did 050 at the same time. Well, it'd be great to do it. I mean, it's a, it's a road that's used a lot. It'd be nice. But we got to look at what it's going to cost. We need to have a study. We need to have some kind of ballpark figure of what that's going to cost. We have, we have bridges within the county that need to be replaced. We have, we have other items that need maintenance, serious maintenance, that, that we have to look at. We have to prioritize, and that's part of uh, being on the commission, being able to prioritize those, those needs within the county and finding out which one of those is the top priority so that we can make sure that we take care of what we have and, and make sure that it lasts. My husband preached a sermon one time on needs, wants, and desires. And I think that the first priority of the county commission is making sure that every need is taken care of, of every department in the county. And then you can move on to the wants, and then you can move on to the desires. And you know, it, you can only go as far as your money goes. Um, you have to maintain, I, I mean, you definitely have to maintain them, whether you can completely redo them with the resources that we have. Um, again, as, as our tax base rises, then you can start using that money for more, more and more projects like that. But needs, wants, and desires. And if I become a commissioner, you'll hear more of that. Needs, wants, and desires. Right, before I go on behalf of all of us here tonight, we want to thank the people who put this on and people who put background in the work. I know that uh, a lot of times uh, the elves do all the work and the fat man the gets the credit. And I know there's a lot of people back there who did a lot of things for us. So I thank them. And you can take that out of my time. That's not a problem. It's simply that you have to have a plan in place on how you're going to do your roads. Number one, you need a traffic count. Where is the most traffic? But just because somebody says this road needs, that road needs, we need to have some data that says this is the way we do it. We need to have a plan in place, whether it's because of uh, 911 calls that they need that road or that bridge fixed, whatever it is. Then we need a plan for the money, the, uh, where the cost will come from, how we do it. It may mean we need to go back to a designated mill levy that goes strictly into that fund. And if the county would support that, I think that would be a good place to start. Well, thank, thank you again to you all for being here. Uh, we do appreciate your time, and, and uh, I want to say thank you to, again to all of our sponsors. Before I do that, though, just a couple of reminders. Uh, advanced voting did begin yesterday, so uh, you can continue to do that, and the primary election is August 7th, so please uh, remember to get out and vote. That's why, that's why we're all here. So again, thank you to our sponsors, uh, Ottawa Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Legislative Action Committee from the Chamber, Franklin County Farm Bureau, American Legion of Post 60, AT&T, and uh, Franklin County for providing the room and, and the recording services. And I want to say thank you to the, the committee members that were here doing all the running and uh, making sure everyone got their questions submitted. And, and thank you to you all for being here this evening. Appreciate it.